everybody, my name is Luke Mar, and this is Hot Mode. And today on Hot Mode, we are coming to you with an Emily in Paris season three fashion breakdown. There's gonna be two parts, and I know I said last time that there would be two parts, but it was so traumatic that it hurt me. This time, it's happening, I promise. Before we get any further into the video, I wanna say a huge shout out to today's sponsor, who is Babbel. Babbel is the language learning platform whose lessons use real life conversations to help you absorb whichever foreign language you want. Whether you are traveling to another country, connecting to friends or family, or using it for professional or personal development, Babbel will help you feel confident and talkative in another language. And for those with language-oriented New Year's resolutions, Babbel will most definitely help you achieve them. Now, if you click the link in my description box below, you will get 60% off your Babbel subscription. Personally, I have wanted to learn French for quite some time. I mean, the name Hot Limode speaks for itself, doesn't it? But I also would like to travel to Paris for work and for fashion weeks, and maybe possibly even be able to actually understand what a waiter is saying. I'd be lying if I said I didn't go to McDonald's for a majority of my meals in Paris because it's easier to use the kiosks than it is to order in a restaurant due to my anxiety about not being even partially fluent in French. Now I knew Babbel was the right pick for me because of its mobile app and desktop options, making it easy to access the lessons developed by real language teachers from just about anywhere. I also love that Babbel uses real-world dialogue in order to help you learn and gives you the basics while still exposing you to words you will hear in frequent conversation as well. And whether those conversations are about things like travel, business, relationships, or more, Babbel will make sure you're prepared. Another issue that I find with language learning is it can be really difficult and while you might be forced to take a class in something like a high school or a college, learning a language on your own is always going to be the more effective choice, which is why I love Babbel too. I picked it up, I want to learn it, and now here we are. I've also learned quite a few new phrases since using Babbel. One is où sont les toilettes, which I'm shocked I have gotten away with not knowing for this long. There are some really cool grammatical things like the difference between vous and tu, which both mean you in French, but one is formal and the other is informal. And I've probably been being super rude to a lot of French people for years. I can even show you a little bit of how the lessons actually go too. So let's do one together. Okay, we're gonna do on se connaît. Je m'appelle Alice. Je m'appelle Alice. Appelle. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. See, I'm kind of done with this, you know what I mean? And my name is Alice. It's Je m'appelle Alice. Je m'appelle Alice. C'est Jérémy. C'est Jérémy. And you do the little accent, it's fun. This is what I like. There's like a dialogue element. Salut. Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle Alice. Salut Alice, je suis Charlotte. All right, Charlotte, what's up? Essaie-je remis mon colocataire? See, you know what I mean? Like, did I know that's... Essaie-je yeah. remis mon colocataire? Colocataire. Enchanté. Tu veux une bière? Oh, enchanté. Tu veux une bière? Oui, merci. Oh, oh, merci beaucoup. Oh oui, merci beaucoup. See? So again, if you want to learn a new language and want to be taught in an effective way that'll keep you both engaged and learning on the go, Babbel is what you need. Click the link in my description box below to get 60% off your Babbel subscription. And with that, on y va. Merci beaucoup, Babel. Wonderful. I made that one up. But let's get on with this Emily in Paris video. So as we all know, Emily is pretty much the poster child of American naivete and ignorance when it comes to foreign travel. And the show has been renewed. Probably in part to the hate watching we all more than likely have contributed to, but let the hating commence and we'll see what happens. Season three begins with Emily atop the Eiffel Tower in a gaudy but somewhat intoxicating feather cape draped pink heart printed dress and sky high platforms and then Emily proceeds to fall off said Eiffel Tower. But alas, it's only a dream. But to be fair, the use of the feather cape really does draw one in as Emily falls. The cape is only highlighted even further. The fact that Emily's wardrobe is highlighted when she's falling off of a very large building about to die, well, speaks for itself. And I will say, at least it didn't turn into something stupid like a parachute. Otherwise, I'd have to blame it for saving her fall. But upon Emily's unfortunate awakening. She dons us with one of her usual, over-the-top, truly confusing, and so vastly aggressive work-appropriate 
outfits. It starts with a knit sweater that has a cream base but is decorated with orange and blue and black and purple and yellow and is like a feral knit that had an identity crisis. But then she proceeds to pair it with a sparkly blue mini skirt that has bits and bobs of pink and green slotted in. And to top it all off, we have, well, a pair of knee-high booger green glitter boots. I want to fight it, but I'm just, I'm tired. Now for context, Marilyn Fatusi did take over from Patricia Field, who did season one and two, I believe. In an interview, Fatusi did say that nobody is, quote, watching the show to see a hoodie, a pair of jeans, and sneakers. But maybe if we did, I wouldn't already have had such a terrible migraine and incurable acid reflux. One more intriguing element is Emily's choice of bag, which is a Louis Vuitton Petite Mal that is from creative director Nicolas Jasquier's fall 2014 collection. The bag is a reference to the French word mal, which means trunk, and is what Louis Vuitton himself built the company on when he founded it back in 1854. Now, Jasquier's first collection for the brand was based on the 1960s, as we can see from the runway, with A-line dresses and leather jackets, which also happened to be Fatusi's inspiration for Emily, as actress Lily Collins cut her own hair for the season. And it supposedly reminded Fatusi of the fashion icons of that age. I love the bag, as you saw. I actually own that one very specifically, although mine has black on the sides, not red. Mine matches with the runway bag, so. I don't know if Emily's handling DH gate bags nowadays, but. <laughs> But I do really think that it was a brilliant nod to Louis Vuitton's history, and I think it was a really cool way to modernize Louis Vuitton while still paying homage to its heritage. But I also think that the bag should have a restraining order put out against the rest of the outfit, as they belong nowhere near each other. They deserve better. Not only does Emily carry a Jesquier era LV bag, but so does Mindy and Camille, with Mindy having a capuchin bag in mint and Camille carrying a twist bag in black. Jesquier also introduced. Now, side note, Camille's outfit is to be honest, so atrocious it's actually making me physically ill. And I won't say that the French are stylish 24 seven, nobody can be, but even I find that this little assertion about French people is very offensive. Now I know that the fashion industry has become more and more open to the idea of Emily in Paris as they saw the way that the show hooked viewers. And so I do wonder if these three bags appearing in sync like this is more than a coincidence. If we look back at Cruella starring Emma Stone, we can see that Louis Vuitton had no problem working a few of their products into the film. So why couldn't they do the same with Emily in Paris in a bid to entice customers? Moving on, I do think Gabrielle is probably the chicest person besides Sylvie, as it looks like he took his investment money and opted to spend a bit of it at somewhere chic and minimal like La Mer or Jill Sander, or maybe even a little bit more affordable places like Uniqlo U. But either way, Fatusi has cleaned him up really, really nicely, and I appreciate it. The salvage denim, C'est chic, merde. As for Mindy, the Byzantine mosaic Madonna skirt that has a cotton striped shirt tucked into it while she performs literally made me audibly gag when I first saw it. Not the in the yes mom of the house down boots tongue pop extravaganza way, but in a getting food poisoning at 3 a.m. kind of way. Somehow, the night of the big pitch to McDonald's, as the French say, McDonald's, we can see that Emily is actually wearing the look from her dream. Now, Fatusi mentioned that the look was actually custom made for the show, and we can see that up close, the look is actually made of ostrich leather. The feathers are pink with dashes of black popped in, and I personally think the shape and the use of the feathers probably inspired by Pierpaolo Piccioli's Valentina. I also think that this is what makes it rather alluring, as for the dress underneath, Emily sheds her cape in order to showcase the pink draped look, which is very 1980s inspired in my opinion, not only because of the use of draping, but also the strong shoulders and the shoulder ruffle that imitates a flower. We can also see that the heart print is actually not a heart print, but rather a rose petal print. And while I think that the dress is rough, I at least appreciate taking inspiration from 1980s French designers like Claude Montana. And as for Sylvie, the subtle but sophisticated use of Elsa Peretti's iconic bone cuffs from Tiffany & Co in sterling silver is just the hook I needed to keep myself reeled in. And with that, we're going to move swiftly on to episode two. Shockingly, I think Emily's first look in the next episode is actually pretty wholesome. Surrounded by flowers, the look is bright and vibrant and bubbly and also quintessentially French, to a degree. The neon rainbow gingham double-breasted blazer is not pour moi, but it's not unreasonable. Where I think Fatusi do a fantastic job here is she captured the essence of stereotypical French style underneath 
that jacket. We can see Emily wears a Breton striped shirt owed to the French Navy officers whose official uniforms it was starting in 1858, and which has since then gained popularity among style and Francophiles. If we use Fatusi's 1960s guideline, the Breton stripe regained popularity among French celebrities of that decade like Jean Seberg and Brigitte Bardot, leading the French new wave in that very classic motif. Now another slight nod that I think might be a little stretch, but possible is that between the Breton striped top and the wide leg pant, Fatusi might be referencing a famous photo of Coco Chanel wearing those two styles together in the 1930s. And that photo also became a popular reference point for fashion decades later on. I mean, it would add to Emily's attempts to fit into French cultural dress to a degree, but her referencing of these classic French styles does seem to only point to her outsider status more blatantly. As for Emily's partner in crime style choices, I say, all that I could forgive, but Mindy, pastels? Now also, Emily's old boss from the US might be partially to blame for encouraging whatever it is Emily has tried to do with her wardrobe. PR people dress a little bit funky, on occasion, I think that this is going a little bit too far. Shockingly, I do think Emily's sleeveless knit dress in atomic yellow and navy blue with that fluffy hem is rather fitting and chic, and that's because it's by the up-and-coming French designer Kevin Germanier. Germanier's work has always been rather loud and bold through colors and sparkles, but also utilizes a sustainable take through textiles as well. This look is off the fall 2022 runway and is more than likely made with yarns that were given given away or given up, and Germanier is able to be a pillar of the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And his ability to turn said trash into treasures like this set is astounding and should be praised. That purple and large town's tooth coat is also not hurting my eyes, so approved. But Emily's outfit for the Pierre Cadeau exhibit is rather show-stopping, as in I want to stop the show from getting a fourth season, please. I understand that the look is meant to be loud, but I don't know. Couldn't we find like an Alessandra Michele for Gucci look that fits the prompt instead of Dolce and Gabbana? I mean, people, please. Luckily, we are saved by Sylvie and Madeline both wearing custom Pierre Cadeau dresses. And as we discussed, Pierre Cadeau is more than likely based on the French fashion legend, Pierre Cadin. And that's never been more evident than the black gowns that the two PR impresarias wear with circular wired veils that almost most definitely referenced the parabolic designs that Cardin popularized during his career, and their placement also might reference the wired veil that was popular during Elizabethan dress too. I mean, the Elizabethan wired veil also like exuded stature and power, which might reflect the dueling nature of Sylvie and Madeline, and so it's a cool Fatusi reference. Of course, Sylvie takes the French simplicity route with minimal accessorization, while Madeline does American gaudy like nobody else, well, except her mentee. Now, JVMA, which I believe is meant to be a fake LVMH, the luxury conglomerate that owns Louis Vuitton, Dior, Givenchy, Fendi, Celine, and more, supposedly never uses outside PR. So cadeau selling to them is an issue for Sylvie. LVMH itself does actually use PR firms outside their in-house teams. Think that this is really just a plot point situation, just for reference. And the episode ends with Emily singing, which means we are moving on to the next one very quickly. Now, episode trois starts with a sweet and petite look with the black wide leg pants, platforms, and a dashing orange crash jacket with the AC logo on the pocket in white. The jacket isn't in the brand's signature vinyl, and so it makes it more believable that this is something that Emily fished out of a vintage stall rather than her shopping at the chic Courage store on Rue Francois Hier. Because if I think of her in that store, it will give me anxiety and I'll never be able to go back in there again. And that store is my literal single French safe space. Please just let me exist without Emily. But then we can see that Emily removes that Courage jacket and has layered a red and white Breton stripe top underneath with a cheetah print crop top cardigan. And I just really need to see the Courage again. Just put it back on. Don't take things off, please and thank you. As Mindy continues on with her performances, she does an ode to Dua Lipa and dons a neon yellow contour catsuit in homage to the Casey Cadwallader design styles that brought Mugler into the modern era. I do think that they should have just followed through on the look by using the Mugler and Jimmy Choo collaboration boots that match the outfit rather than the plastic versions they used, but this is Emily in Paris. Expecting common sense is, well, a you problem, a me problem. 
an us problem, unfortunately. But I will say I do like the new Garkatsu. Always looks good. Now, Emily's look when she finds out that Savoir is being ended feels like a Christmas disaster from the red and white Breton striped top paired with the green sweater whose exposed hips I actually kind of love, just not together. And while the skirt reminds me of the great Patrick Kelly, it's not Patrick Kelly, and it doesn't remind me of him enough to make it work with the outfit either. Now, I do love that Sylvie, when Agence Grotto opens officially, is wearing an all white and cream look, almost like there is a blank slate for her new venture. And I can't deny that that billowing sleeve top is very, very cool. And that's the end of episode three, thank God. Episode four starts with Emily in an orange top with blue faux embroidered needlework motifs. I think live streaming her Herself in that alone should have gotten her banned from all social media platforms. As for Kemi, the black overalls with the white button down and the veil trimmed beret should be a red flag for any artist looking for representation for her. They should just run. Also, she seems more Berlin in that outfit than she does Paris. Now, art gallerists, in my opinion, are supposed to be chic and cool. They wear crazy avant-garde styles like Comme des Garçons or Loewe, or super minimal styles like Jill Sander and The Row, and everything in between. But they certainly don't look like knock-off Maria Grazia Curie's Dior pre-fall mannequins. Let art curators like Kimberly Drew and Antoine Sargent be shining examples of how people that work in art don't dress like that. On a date with Alfie in the park, Emily wears a floral halter dress that she then wears to work in Gabrielle's restaurant as a server. I mean, the dress is tough due to the floral and the halter styles feeling like oh, a little bit too 1950s housewife for my comfort. And then there is also like legitimately very little way that the dress would be manageable for someone who hasn't waited in years to, you know, run around a whole restaurant in. At least in my opinion. Her next look also features a dress, a black strap dress with white cup detail, but earlier in the day, Emily of course paired it with a cartoony cheetah print bomber jacket. And neither look great, but together, they're abysmal. The night of Camille's big art installation at the gallery, she does actually wear a Scaparelli jacket by Daniel Rosebury, and I think it was a brilliant way to go about dressing her. Finally, Kemi works in the art world, as previously mentioned, and wearing a designer that practically invented artistic collaboration between the fashion world and the art world is honestly just a really nice nod to fashion history, and I think it's what we should be seeing from these characters that surround Emily. The back and forth of Kemi's style aesthetic is rather off-putting because I think she and characters like Sylvie should buffer Emily's outrageous and very tactless styles super effortlessly. But besides Sylvie, it seems that this is seldom done with Kemi, and I personally find that it makes her unlikable. In moments like these, where she wears a nod to Scaparelli's artistic inclinations, she's seen as smart and well-read, but in other moments throughout the series thus far, she feels, well, like a costumed clown. And speaking of Sylvie, she is Emily's true foible in yet another Scaparelli look, and I'm so glad that we get to see two ravishing examples of Rosebury's revival of the brand on screen. Sylvie wears a tank dress from Scaparelli's Spring 2021 collection, and its gold chain straps are one thing, but the gold nipple castings are both shocking, yet so refined on Sylvie. The thing about her is she does not demand attention. Rather, she just creates it. And that is the true difference between her and Emily. And why moments like these that should be so, so shocking, offensive to the prudish, or rather just experienced when it comes to Sylvie's charm. Now, for those not in the know about Scaparelli, Elsa Scaparelli is the brand's founder, and she was a fan of body parts and started to create jewelry out of items like eyes, noses, while she was still working in the early and mid 20th century. Now, Daniel Roseberry, the American designer who has brought the brand back into a whole new level of relevance, utilized these styles and has leveraged them as a powerful commercial tool, not only to fuel the brand's commercial element, but also a cultural comeback. And soon thereafter, he began to incorporate these jewelry pieces into garments as not just accessories, but actual design elements, which resulted in these little golden nipple pasty pieces. In reality, I commend Fatusi, as I think she alludes to Sylvie's seductive charm and actions that she shouldn't be condemned for, but rather applauded for as she uses what she has been given to get what she needs. Through both her energy and abilities, this dress is just perfect on Sylvie. And then we see Emily once again attract a 1960s flair when she wears a coat from Yumu's Fall 2015 resort collection that I again commend Fatusi for. Listen, 
Is it brash and bold and very bright green paisley? Yeah, but I do think that it captures the silhouette of the decade through its A-line cut, and I do think it plays on Miu Miu's aesthetic of youthful and whimsical through the eye of Miu Prada, looking back at her own early life growing up in, you guessed it, the 1960s, and loving the designers that ruled the decade so well. I stand alone. And our last episode of this video, episode five. We're gonna start this episode off with a Julien moment, which I'm kind of sad to say, because I think that he has kind of been lacking fashion-wise this season. Julien feels a little bit forgotten, and while his outfits usually are still bright, they really don't stand out in a way that is noticeable or exciting. They just feel sort of stale, except for this suit from Botter's Fall 2022 collection. The look is a blazer with a cutout that stretches from the neck down to the rib cage on both sides of the jacket, giving the illusion that it is in fact a two-piece bolero jacket and halter vest, when in reality it is just fully connected and a suit jacket. I think it's honestly a moment and something I'd like to see a little bit more of from Julia. Although the sneakers with the split hem is a literal crime, like it's disgusting. We can also see Sylvie in a Vivian Westwood tiger print cocktail dress, which I personally don't think works, but in the memory of Vivian Westwood, I thought we should just still mention it. As for Emily, I think that the sad striped clown bloomers are disgraceful, and the jacket she wears with the gingham bra underneath is also The hit or miss that goes on in each frame she's in gives me, again, serious anxiety, and it might be why I'm biting my nails again. And then Emily follows it with an outfit straight out of 2012 in metallic tapered pants with such disturbing pointy-toed heeled boots and a metallic purple and gold camo bomber jacket. I can't believe that was even let out of, I don't know, a workshop, let alone let into the wardrobe department. Now somehow the black and white houndstooth outfit that follows and that Emily wears at Alfie's party is pretty cool. The tassels that flow out of the jacket and the matching dress add texture and dimension and the fact that the set actually matches gives me a true sense of relief. And considering it's Balmain, I am appreciative that Fatusi veered away from that usual simple double-breasted blazer style that many Balmain customers opt for. As for Mindy though, she just always looks cheap. And I understand that she's been cut off from her parents, hence dressing her in that sparkly two-piece set. But as she mentioned earlier this season, she went to La Rose. Now, La Rose is the most exclusive boarding school in the world that costs around $130,000 a year to attend. While she might be quote unquote slumming it, her outfit should reflect the remnants of a woman that had immense access to designer clothing, but rather should be a few seasons or years old. A sparkle set that looks like it came from Sheen with body jewelry is not bolstering her character background enough to me. Okay, yes. Is it an Elisabetta Franchi set with premium price tag? Sure, probably, but again, looks cheap. I just feel like with Mindy, we should just have Dior Chanel looks from a few seasons ago, you know what I mean? Like when her parents were still letting her swipe whatever card she wanted. I just don't understand the ugly outfits. Now, Emily's love for gingham materializes a lot this season, and when she wears a puff sleeve top and matching skirt in green and white, I think it's one of the moments where she looks incredibly chic. I also think this might be another nod to the 1960s, as the motif was popular throughout the decade and can be seen on famous models like Jean Shrimpton and Twiggy, as well as French stars like Brigitte Bardot. Now, Emily's next outfit in the silhouette is cool. Her turtleneck top tucked into a pair of hot pants with a duster coat would be very, very sweet and interesting and intriguing if it wasn't for, well, the color and print assault that hits you right after you see the actual silhouette. Besides the leftover drugstore Halloween turtleneck from the clearance section marked down to free, as long as it actually leaves the store, to those hideous diamond printed shorts in a cornucopia of fall colors, to the fact that she's wearing Dolce and Gabbana again. You know, besides all that, I can appreciate the outfit, but with all of that, I think that I might just lay down on the ground and contemplate, well, the meaning of the world, and not in a meditative way. Now, Emily also does wear the Louis Vuitton couchon bag in black with embossed LV monogram, but I don't think it works well with the outfit, although it might inspire sales of the bag, again, from Netflix's very large audience. The episode ends with a flop look, so it doesn't help. That's part one of our Emily in Paris review. Season three, it had some moments that were decent and then for the most part, it was rough. Do I have a best and a worst look? No, 
not really. They all mash together in a cacophony of disastrous stylings. And I do actually appreciate Marilyn Fatusi a little bit more than I did Patricia Field, to be completely frank and fair. I think the idea of the 1960s, constant tie-in, and little elements and references is really cool, and so I do appreciate her. And to be serious, I do think there were some intriguing and nice outfits, both on Sylvie, on Emily. But again, it's still Emily in Paris, so you constantly question what the is going on. Part two will be out soon. I promise it will actually materialize. I want to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Did you like the season? Did you watch the season? Could you not stomach the outfits and so you threw up your lunch? Who knows? Again, thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys in the next one and TTYL.